Hello, everybody. My name is Michael Chiakos. I'm CEC's Director of Climate Policy. Right now, it's a little afternoon. We're going to get started in just a minute, and we'll wrap up by 1 p.m. As everyone is coming in, feel free to add your name, pronouns, location, and any affiliation into the chat so that we can meet you all. Hey, Andy from Santa Barbara, nice to see you. And Barbara, thanks for joining us. Well, it looks like we have John from North Idaho College, so far our, our farthest attendee, unless you count um, our presenter, Jamal, who's beaming in from Washington, DC. Some folks from Orchid, Carpinteria, Santa Barbara, Ventura, great to hear. So it's 12.02. Um, let's see if we can start sharing the webinar slides. I think we should start getting going. Well, welcome everybody. Today's webinar is how the momentum of recent climate policy is a win for you. This is part of CEC's Climate Action Webinar Series. And my name is Michael Chiakos. I'm CEC's Director of Climate Policy. And I've been at CEC since 2007, first building our clean transportation programs and then directing our energy and transportation programs to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. I'm most proud of our, my role in bringing community choice energy providers and 100% renewable electricity to our region a couple decades earlier than uh, the state goals, as well as starting Electric Drive 805, which is a collaborative, making it easier to drive electric vehicles in our region. And last year, I launched CEC's new climate policy program, and we're really excited to share our progress with you. I wanna thank everyone for coming. Uh, we wanna share the, how the recent wave of climate policies are so exciting and critical. We'll be covering some of the basics of how policies at the federal, the state and the local level are pushing forward tremendous action and they can directly help your bank account. And we'll also unveil CEC's new policy platform which is a powerhouse plan that's designed to support local governments in creating a rapid, equitable transition to clean energy and climate safe communities. And thanks in advance to my fellow speakers, Alexis Rizzo and Jamal Lewis, their policy experts who will work with me to answer your questions in real time in the Q&A as well. We also have a support team to help us, including Nicole and Jillian on the tech side, Kristen and Katie, who you'll see as panelists, and Lisa and Jeannie Marie, who are monitoring the, the chat in Q&A. So first, a little housekeeping. This webinar is being recorded, and you will receive a link to the recording and all the resources after the event. Very handy to have. Uh, this is an active session. Your engagement is welcome. You can add questions to the Q&A during the presentations. And if someone has a similar question to you, you can upvote that question by uh, clicking the little thumbs up next to it. And please use the chat for any other comments, concerns, appreciations. You can even share resources uh, with other attendees. So we'll have a couple uh, polls now to kick us off. Nicole, if you can launch those. The first one is how familiar are you with federal, state, and local climate policies? One is least familiar and five would be, you're pretty knowledgeable about climate policies. The next poll is how often do you currently advocate for policies? So this could be emails or letters, maybe verbal public comment that you, you go to a city council meeting. Do you do that frequently all the way to never? And then the last question is, which of these clean energy technologies do you currently use? Electric vehicle, solar, battery storage, heat pump, and while we're waiting for the results of those polls, um, a little about us, CEC is a nonprofit that has pioneered environmental solutions on California Central Coast for more than 50 years. And our work is focused on advancing rapid and equitable solutions to the climate crisis, including ambitious zero carbon goals, drawdown of excess carbon, and protection against the impacts of climate change. We believe that together we can reverse climate change, repair the damage, and protect local communities from extreme weather effects. 
And as you'll see, this has been a recent large focus for uh, the federal government and states. You may know us mostly from our work to move our region away from uh, fossil fuels in our climate mitigation programs, 100% renewables, drive less, electric vehicles, electric buildings, as well as our waste reduction uh, programs, um, uh, particularly in plastics and food. But we also have newer programs in climate justice, climate leadership, climate smart ag, and climate resilience. And you'll get to hear a lot about some of these um, throughout the presentation. And so let's see, do we have the poll results, Nicole? Well, let's see, most people are moderately familiar with climate policies. We've got a few experts in the room. We have uh, frequent advocates, great to hear, about 16% and then 60% occasionally. And then, oh wow, so 65% of you uh, have an electric vehicle, 49% solar, 20% battery storage, and 27% heat pumps. So we're really uh, preaching to the choir and the early adopters, great to have you um, together with us. So I just want to share that as someone who's been working uh, for the last, uh, if we can advance the slide, if we, for the last 15 years on climate issues, that the last few months we've seen the most progress ever. And I'm really elated by this climate progress. Policy is very important because it pushes private industry and other actors in the right direction. Um, a lot of different laws can include uh, carrots, but also sticks, uh, changes to the tax code from the federal government. And this is really important because, especially after the Trump years, the US government has been lagging on climate action. And as the largest historic emitter, we really need to act. And that's what we've seen. We have the strongest wins at our back ever from the federal government, as well as uh, California and other state policies right now. And this is really exciting because there's a large international ramifications. So when the US leads, then other large emitters can say, okay, the US is in, we're in, we're gonna cooperate on the international scale. And then the other thing is that as you'll hear, uh, particularly the Inflation Reduction Act is really about scaling solutions that are accessible right now and, and making them cheaper and that will really drive innovation as well as scaling manufacturing so that they're cheaper everywhere. So even places that don't have climate policies as strong as California or the United States will be, be able to take advantage of a lot of these clean energy technologies. Next. So I'm going to just talk for uh, a few minutes about the um, federal, state, and local, and then we'll turn it over to, to Jamal. Um, to really get in depth on the Inflation Reduction Act. But uh, first up, we had the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. This was actually passed last year uh, and, and is really the first of this historic federal climate progress that we're, that we're seeing. Um, it, had, uh, it has $170 billion for climate infrastructure and climate resilience. And this is uh, very focused on um, the grid. So making sure that we can increase amounts of renewable energy and move them around different parts of the country. Uh, there was a huge amount of funding for transit so that we can reduce the amount of driving that we collectively do. Uh, there was funding for electric buses, including school buses and transit buses, and then funding for charging infrastructure that uh, any electric vehicle driver will be able to take advantage of. And then there was one other main act, the Inflation Reduction Act, and this was $369 billion for climate action. It, it has a, a, a funny name, but it really was a climate bill. And um, it's focused on making the cost of renewables, storage, electric vehicles, energy efficiency, electric buildings, uh, much cheaper. And these are oftentimes 10-year programs, 10-year uh, tax credits so that Companies and individuals have a very long planning horizon and can make sure that, that um, they take advantage of them. And so for most of us that were following, uh, the climate bill is a real nail biter. Uh, there was a couple key senators that were holding things up and a lot of people actually thought that we wouldn't be able to pass a climate bill. Uh, and then um, Senator Manchin, who's a Democrat from coal country in West Virginia, uh, brokered a, a last minute deal. and um, 
While it's a little scaled back from Biden's climate plan, uh, most climate advocates are very happy with uh, what passed. It's mostly carrots, so it uses the tax code and spending bills to lower the overall cost of climate solutions and accelerate deployment. And another thing that's really exciting about um, the IRA and some of the other bills is there's a big focus on environmental justice. So the, the Justice 40 initiative uh, is a new one by the federal government to make sure that 40% of the overall benefits of certain federal investments flow to disadvantaged communities that are marginalized, underserved, and often overburdened by pollution. And there's also often uh, enhanced incentives for low to moderate income folks. So these are the two big bills that passed, as well as um, there are uh, other smaller bills and then some executive orders that are making a lot of other climate progress as well. But on the, the federal level, this is really the historic climate progress. Next. On the state level, also California has been leading for a very long time, um, but we have uh, in the last few months seen the most progress that I've seen in, in, a, in a couple decades as well. Um, the first one up here, CARB, is the California Air Resources Board. And they're the state agency that's in charge of clean air regulating the clean air. They're, they're called the most powerful regulatory agency in the world, and that's because they can set California standards that are stricter than the federal standards. And oftentimes, uh, a third of the states may go along um, with cal the California standards. And they're also in charge of the climate planning and, and developing regulations to meet California's climate goals that the legislature passes. And so this is uh, very exciting. Two huge things that happened uh, this year First, you've probably heard about, so the regulation to get to 100% new electric vehicle sales by 2035, and interim targets are 68% by 2030. So this is really going to make sure that we're phasing out gas and diesel in passenger vehicles. And then there's a whole host of other regulations in the medium and heavy duty sector that are coming down the pike as well. And then they're also developing, or they have developed a scoping plan. They're going to be voting on it uh, in, in the next couple of weeks, um, with, which basically is the plan to reach carbon neutrality in California as soon as possible or by 2045 at the latest. So these are two really important regulations that CEC um, commented on and, and lobbied for that you'll hear about a little later on. And then also in the legislature, they passed $54 billion in multi-year climate spending. So the largest climate investment ever. And uh, they codified our carbon neutrality goal uh, by 2045 or so as soon as possible. So it's not just an aspirational ambition, it's actually state law and CARB is the one who's, who's developing the, the plan and regulations to get us there. Um, there was bills for, um, a plan and target to sequester carbon in natural and working land, something CEC has been very supportive of and, and we'll talk about, um, to increase uh, California's goal to get to 90% clean electricity by 2035. We're already ahead of that here on the Central Coast, but it's really good for the rest of the state. Other bills on affordable electric vehicles for all, um, on uh, oil drilling buffer zones, and on plastics recycling. Next. And I just wanted to share with everyone, there's a lot of gloom and doom out there in you know, reading about climate stories, but we're making a lot of progress. Uh, we're on this glide path to 100% clean and renewable electricity in California. And here on the Central Coast, we're actually ahead of the game. Most of Ventura County and the city of Santa Barbara is already at 100% renewable energy because of our community choice agencies. And, um, the rest of Santa Barbara County and San Luis Obispo cities are on the path to 100% renewables by 2030. And this is all new construction, new build, solar and wind, geothermal and energy storage uh, that Central uh, Coast Community Energy is bringing online. And so we're going to use that 100% renewables to in our electric vehicles and electric buildings. Uh, we're making a huge amount of, of progress with electric transportation. You've heard about uh, that we're moving uh, away from gas and diesel vehicles and uh, also in uh, all electric buildings. 
we're moving forward many cities with all electric building codes and, and figuring out also how to get natural gas out of existing buildings. And then we also have very strong local programs that just a few years ago didn't exist. Our community choice agencies that are putting tens of millions of dollars to help us adopt clean energy technologies weren't around a few years ago. And neither was uh, 3C Regional Energy Network. And they have some incentive programs that you'll hear about a little later in the presentation. Next. And so now we're gonna go uh, into Jamal's presentation. I'd like to introduce Jamal Lewis. Uh, Jamal is a director of policy partnerships and equitable electri electrification for rewiring America. He leads their equitable electrification efforts to ensure everyone can access the benefits of electrification. He facilitates the Federal Electrification Policy Coalition, which is a coalition of advocates advancing electrification policy at the federal level. And he supports the Bicameral Congressional Electrification Caucus. He has multiple publications outlining pathways to pr promoting equity by retrofitting our existing housing stock to be healthy, energy efficient, all electric and affordable. He is a young, gifted, and green 40 under 40 award recipient for his leadership in environmental justice. And today, Jamal is going to share with us details on the Federal Inflation Reduction Act and ways it can help you save money on clean technology purchases. So Jamal, take it away. Thank you, Michael. And uh, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. Uh, I'm just going to get right into my uh, presentation. Uh, so again, I'm Jamal Lewis. I'm with Rewiring America. Uh, who are we? Uh, we were founded in 2020 with the idea of uh, electrifying everything. Uh, and why is that important? So uh, uh, we did a, a study and found that uh, about 87% of our country's emissions, nationwide emissions, come from the energy sector, different parts of the energy sector, um, distribution, uh, uh, consumption, um, uh, so different parts of the energy sector, and of that, of the of that eighty two percent, eighty seven percent, forty two percent of those emissions come from decisions that all of us make. What does that mean? That means the type of cars that we drive, the type of uh, how we heat our homes and water, how we cook our food. These are all consumer decisions that uh, that a lot of us have the power to make. So the number, the percentage of emissions, you know, rises up to seventy percent uh, when we include where we uh, live, work, learn, play, and pray. So that's a lot of emissions that we can address by making different decisions. The Inflation Reduction Act, which is uh, what I'm here to talk about, does a lot for the electrification movement. Um, we're not going to talk about all of it but we're really gonna focus on these, con these consumer facing uh, incentives that are gonna help uh, and incentivize all of us uh, to make different decisions uh, when, we're, uh, when we're in that position. So what does the Inflation Reduction Act do? It provides some tax credits uh, and some, uh, some consumer rebates that we're gonna talk about. The first one is this 25C residential energy efficiency tax credit. This is for uh, uh, residential uh, uh, efficiency measures and electrification. So, purchasing an electric heat pump would uh, would qualify uh, for a tax credit, but also things like electrical panel upgrades, uh, door and window replacement, insulation. Um, these are all measures that will, or it, uh, retrofit items that would qualify for this 25C tax credit. How much? So for heat pumps, uh, so that's like heat pump space heaters, heat pump water heaters. Uh, these are highly efficient ways of heating and cooling our homes and water. The cap in terms of the tax credit is $2,000. Um, for everything else, there's a cap of $1,200. So uh, in theory, you could do a heat pump uh, and also insulation, and you could receive $3,200 um, back in tax credits. These credits reset every year, which helps with um, spacing out these, these retrofits over time. 
So if you wanted to do electrical panel upgrades and do your, get your heat pump, heat pump space heater this year, you could do that. But the next year, you could do a door replacement and then your heat pump water heater. And in both years, we'll be able to claim $3,200. Unfortunately, these are non-refundable. So households would have to have sufficient tax liability in order to benefit from these tax credits. And there are some requirements that I uh, won't get into right now. Um, but the one thing that I will say is that these, uh, these are new credits that start in 2023. So your purchases in 2023 would qualify for tax credits when you file your taxes in 2024. Um, and these are the amounts again, uh, in which I, you'll you'll get these slides so you can you can see these uh, at your leisure. The 25D tax credit has to do with uh, uh, residential energy production. So thinking about geothermal heat pumps, solar panels, and battery storage, those are the three uh, um, technologies that are eligible for this tax credit. Uh, except for battery storage, uh, the other two are. Uh, eligible for tax credits um, in 2023. So any heat, geothermal heat pumps and solar panels that you install for the rest of this year, you would be eligible to get a tax credit in 2023. These are also non-refundable, which is really important. Um, and uh, we'll also note that this 25D tax credit may also cover community solar uh, in some cases, or we are really looking uh, to the Department of Treasury to give us more guidance on that. Uh, yeah, moving on. Um, I added this really quick too, since I know electric vehicles uh, you all uh, really care about. There's also tax credits for new electric vehicles. So a max credit of $7,500. Um, <clears throat> and there are some income limits. So for a single household, uh, you can get the $7,500 credit if you make less than $150,000 a year, $225,000 for the uh, um, for a head of household, and then $300K for joint filers. And there are some cost limitations as well, uh, which are listed there. In addition to those new tax credits, uh, the tax credits for new vehicles, there's also a, a credit for used electric vehicles as well to help stimulate the electric vehicle used car market. So that's a max of $4,000, and there are also income limits uh, for that too, income and cost limits. Uh, one other thing to note, the 30C allows for consumers like you and I uh, to also get a tax credit for installing electric vehicle charging stations. Um, and these are fortunately, and I think unfortunately for some people, these are limited to uh, rural and low-income communities. Uh, so it's really meant to help uh, boost up the infrastructure to help uh, in incentivize people to make different decisions when they're buying cars. In addition to those tax credits, there are also two rebate programs that I'm going to talk about. One is this high efficiency electric home rebates program, otherwise known as the electrification rebates program. And these are uh, point of sale rebates. So they're basically discounts at the point of sale uh, for qualifying electric appliances, heat pumps, heat pump water heaters, electric stoves, uh, electric clothes dryers, um, but also includes basic weatherization as well as electrical panel upgrades uh, and other rewiring work that needs to be done in the home. Um, these are uh, income qualified programs uh, or uh, income qualified program. So only households that make 150% below the area median income, which we'll talk about in just a second, qualify for uh, this point of sale rebate. Um, those making below 80% of the area median income can have 100% of the cost covered up to a cap of $14,000. Um, those between 80 and 150% of AM, uh, area median income uh, get 50% of the cost covered. These are going to be administered at the state level, so at the state energy office. Um, and I will note that multifamily buildings can also qualify uh, if 50, greater than 50% of the occupants are low and moderate income. Uh, there's also the home energy performance-based whole house rebates program. I would think of this as just whole home efficiency upgrades. 
So any upgrade that is going to result in uh, re reduced or result in energy savings or reduced energy consumption, you, those measures qualify under this program. So weatherization qualifies, electrification qualifies. Um, one thing to note about this uh, rebate program is that it is not income qualified, but there are enhanced incentives for uh, low and moderate income households defined by 80% of the area median income. These will also be administered at your state energy office. Um, and we are expecting both of these rebate programs to, uh, to be live towards the end of 2023. So uh, what are some other details about these rebates? Um, the rebates can be stacked on top of the tax credits. So if you are someone that would qualify for the rebate and would also qualify to receive tax credits, uh, you can combine the two and stack the two to lower the cost as much as possible for you. Um, there are uh, requirements for the types of appliances that can qualify, uh, have to have that Energy Star label. And to give you a sense for this like area median income concepts, here is Santa Barbara County. Uh, you can see the median income there that's bolded uh, towards the bottom. The low income, <clears throat> excuse me, the low income row represents 80% of area median income. And these are the 2021 numbers. The moderate income uh, row represents 120%, not 150, 120. So you can think about uh, this helps to give you a sense for what those numbers are. Currently, they do not have 150% uh, categorization, so they're going to have to create that for this program. Uh, and then I have a, a slide here just to say there are some uh, programs and provisions that renters can take advantage of when thinking about the rebates or the tax credits. Um, there are technologies that are portable, such as like, you know, portable uh uh, portable in, like induction cooktops or portable heat pumps, which are starting to hit the market. Uh, we are uh, in, you know, we're we, we're waiting for guidance from the IRS and Treasury, but we suspect that those technologies will also be eligible for tax credits and rebates. Um, I'm going to wrap up and and kick it back over to uh, Michael uh, or Alexis. Um, but I just want to plug that we do have a guide on our website that can help you navigate uh, the programs in the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, so check out that guide. We also have a calculator that will help you understand the resources that are available to you uh, that we sometimes call your electric bank account uh, and what exactly will be in that electric bank account that you can leverage to help uh, reduce emissions in your own life. So. That is my presentation, uh, and I look forward to questions. Great. Thank you so much, Jamal, for the details on uh, federal policies and all those incentives. I know we have a lot of early adopters on the call who probably won't be taking advantage of them. Um, I see there's some questions. Keep them, keep them coming. And um, Jamal covered many of the tax incentives in, in the IRA, uh, but these can also be combined with many other state and local incentives. And there's really way too much to cover this presentation, which is mostly focused on policy. Um, but I'd like to direct you to some resources, our electric vehicle webinar recording and info page. Um, and so you can hear more about the 2,000 to 7,000 um, for new or used EVs by taking advantage of those um, rebates, as well as learn a lot more about electric vehicles. And then, um, also, I'd like to direct you to the 3C Regional Energy Network Regional Program, which drastically reduces the cost of electrification retrofits. So that's um, the next link there. And folks in Santa Barbara, Ventura, and San Luis Obispo counties can receive discounted pricing on energy upgrades by working with 3C REN Single Family Program. And then the next link um, from Central Coast Community Energy's Electrify Your Home Program there's more rebates that are available if you're in their service territory. And then the final link is to the Switches On, which is a state program that really helps you understand why electrification is important. It's aimed at consumers, as well as you can find contractors to do your electrification uh, program, either on the Switches On, as well as 
um, on the 3C RAN uh, website link there. So uh, next, we'd like to share about some recent wins at the state and local level. Next slide. To do that, I'd like to introduce Alexis Rizzo, CEC's policy associate. Alexis leads local and regional policy campaigns, such as pushing local governments to adopt electric vehicle action plans and all electric codes for new construction. To have the uh, few remaining cities join our community choice agencies. She leads coalition building and turning out grassroots climate activists and comments on climate action and other plans. Alexis has a bachelor's in political science from Cal Lutheran was born and raised in Oxnard and primarily focuses on Ventura County advocacy. So Alexis, take it away. Yeah. Thank you, Michael, um, for that introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm happy to be here and talk through CEC's local policy advocacy work and um, all the work that's happening on the Central Coast. Uh, as you can see, CEC's uh, policy team has been quite busy with 73 actions so far this year. We work with various coalitions as well as community grassroots organizations to support equitable and ambitious state and federal um, climate legislation and regulations, which I will highlight soon. CEC's policy team is most active on local and regional policies, pushing our local governments <clears throat> and agencies by submitting comment letters, attending hearings, educating policymakers, and providing policy analysis and recommendations on planning processes and local policies, as well as ordinances. Next, I'll talk more specifically about some of the recent local policy wins. Um, here, you can see some of our largest policy wins that have taken place this past year. Uh, there's a lot of information that I want to share on this slide but it does go back to what Michael was speaking to earlier around 100% renewable energy, building electrification and EV planning. Uh, CEC's policy team in the past year has been advocating for various local policies that promote a healthy and equitable climate safe future um, and working collaboratively with our climate justice team to ensure equitable outcomes in our advocacy work through education and outreach. This on the ground work is particularly exciting because local work actually has the potential to score big, especially in California. The state is one of the leading regions um, in the world for environmental policy, and much of this breakthrough work um, being done at the state level is because of local governments taking initiative to enact bold climate policies like the ones at Community Environmental Council that we are pushing for. We've been working with the County of Santa Barbara to make bold moves on electric vehicles. And one of the largest wins of the year came when the County of Supervisors actually voted to move forward with an EV action plan, hire an EV focused staff member to implement it and up their EV purchasing policy. At our urging a couple years ago, they decided to only purchase EVs for sedans. And this year they actually increased their goal to also include purchasing only EV trucks and SUVs. And part of the reason uh, that the county felt confident to do this was uh, a new program through Central Coast Community Energy that dedicates $8 million a year to member agencies for electrification. Uh, CEC has been a tireless advocate pushing Central Coast Community Energy to offer more funding for programming like this one. Uh, CEC and partners like the Sierra Club and Seafrog have been pushing local governments to adopt all electric codes for new construction, uh, which is more equitable, affordable, healthier, and sustainable. The County of Ventura recently adopted an all electric code, and Carpinteria, Goleta, and County of Santa Barbara are posed to do so soon, which we're really excited about. Uh, we can't keep constructing new buildings with natural gas if we we're to meet our carbon neutrality goals. CEC was also successful in having Santa Paula join Clean Power Alliance, a regional community choice agency that serves Ventura and LA counties, and it is actually the largest provider of 100% renewable electricity in the nation. Community Choice Energies are local not-for-profit organizations and businesses 
or organizations that purchase electricity on behalf of communities and businesses that they serve. And they help meet cities' climate goals by offering renewable energy options. And they reinvest profits right back into the communities that they serve. We also campaigned in the cities of Fillmore and Port Wyneme, and we're hopeful that they will join next year as well. We also uh, have been active in providing policy analysis, commenting on and working with grassroots climate activists to push for ambitious climate action plans, as well as making sure access to participating in the planning processes is inclusive for all members of the community, such as making sure multilingual resources are available. You can see how many local governments are updating or creating climate action plans right now, with many of them incorporating climate resiliency and addressing environmental justice in these plans. Next slide, please. Uh, CEC has been on the ground connecting with grassroots organizations, climate concerned residents, and other local environmental groups in an effort to um, amplify our collective voice on environmental policies that the community wants to see adopted in our region. CEC continues to identify and activate climate concerned community members. Um, in doing so, CEC is helping community members engage in policy advocacy matters at their city council and board of supervisor meetings um, through education and outreach, especially to our gr to groups who have historically been left out of these conversations, ensuring that those that have been harmed by environmental injustice and who are likely to be hurt first and worse by the impacts of climate change will benefit first and foremost from climate action. Our policy team is also dedicating more time to building stronger relationships with elected officials and sustainability staff as well. We meet regularly with local climate champions and are pushing local governments to add sustainability staff so they do have more capacity for climate action. We are also a part of statewide coalitions to bring successful program and policies from other regions here. When many leading cities around the state pass local ordinances, the state is emboldened um, to act. So for example, dozens of cities passed 100% renewable energy goals or plastic bag goals. Um, and then the state moved forward with similar laws for the entire state. With many cities passing all electric building codes, um, it's also likely that the state may make all electric the new building code in the next couple of years too. Uh, we work with statewide groups such as the Climate Center or the California Climate Agriculture Network to identify top legislative priorities and support bills and regulations that are in most impactful to our mission. We sign on to letters and strategically engage on the most impactful bills. And this year's legislative session was historic. Um, California codifying our commitment to carbon neutrality by 2045 or sooner, increasing California's clean and renewable electricity goal to 90% by 2035 and establishing a plan and goals for carbon sequestration in natural and working lands among many other noteworthy bills. On the regulatory front, we submitted extensive comments and had discussions with six board members or, or staff at the California Air Resources Board on the 100% electric vehicle sales by 2035 regulation and the scoping plan for carbon neutrality by 2045 or earlier. Uh, now I'll hand it back. I'll hand it back to Michael to share the latest on um, CEC's policy work. Thank you, Alexis. So yeah, we're very excited to share with you CEC's recently released policy platform. And I've worked for a long time at CEC since 2007 and have always done some policy work. But just in the last year, now we have a dedicated policy team, of which Alexis and I lead. And I'll review some of um, the highlights in our last few slides. And then I also really encourage you to go to the website to review the full platform. Then we'll get to Q&A. Next. So 
climate action plans, um, we're working with many cities, as Alexis showed, to really um, push them to adopt ambitious local government climate action plans. And one city I want to call out is the city of Santa Barbara. They're developing their second climate action plan with a goal of carbon neutrality by 2035. That's a full 10 years before the state. So it'll be really exciting to see um, what's in it. And I hope that you climate advocates out there will engage in the process and push the city of Santa Barbara and, and help them. We're also um, working to advocate for uh, community choice energy providers to stay on track to reach 100% renewables and develop and fund robust programs to help us all adopt clean energy technologies. And so we have three community choice agencies, Central Coast Community Energy, Clean Power Alliance, and Santa Barbara Clean Energy um, that are developing programs to help equitably uh, help local residents and organizations to adopt clean energy technologies such as electric vehicles, heat pumps for high efficiency heating and cooling, solar, energy storage, et cetera. Um, we're also advocating for local governments to develop electric vehicle action plans and put in more charging infrastructure, as you heard Alexis talk about. Um, we're also championing all electric uh, building codes, which are really no brainers because all electric buildings are uh, less expensive to build, they're safer to live in, and they're more sustainable. Um, but how do you electrify existing buildings? We're really leaning into this in the next year to see how other regions are tackling this problem, uh, starting with um, all the voluntary uh, programs and new incentives that, that you've heard about today. Um, we're also ensuring that Central Coast cities and counties uh, meet or exceed the requirements of SB 1383. So this is a new state mandate to reduce organic waste in California. And CEC was an early leader with our food recovery programs. It makes no sense to send edible food to the landfill to produce methane when it could be used to feed needy people or make compost for climate smart ag. And then we've also had a success with plastic bag and other bans, and we're part of a coalition to push an extender produ extended producer responsibility bill for plastic reduction. And now that it's been passed, we have a role to watchdog and make sure that this bill is implemented well. Next. Um, so you've heard about uh, CEC's longstanding programs to reduce fossil fuel usage. Uh, we're very pragmatic though that you know, in the next decade or two, we'll still be using fossil fuels and that we need to figure out how to sequester that remaining carbon. And um, our, our program in, in Climate Smart Ag, which is also known as regenerative agriculture, seeks to just do that. There's dozens of practices to build carbon in the soil. Um, many have been practiced for millennium, things like reducing tillage or, or hedgerows. And there's big co-benefits for um, keeping water in, in, in the soils and healthy soils. And so we're advocating for the advancement of state carbon sequestration targets that include an emphasis on natural and working lands as a solution because there's so many co-benefits much more and beyond carbon capture and, and storage. While um, we supported a bill to develop an ambitious natural and working land sequestration target, what passed was a bill to study the issue and develop a target. So we'll be working with partners to analyze the report and push for ambitious solutions. Um, you may have uh, also heard uh, that many local governments are developing climate action plans. Some like the County of Santa Barbara's will have meaningful involvement of natural and working lands. And CEC will be analyzing these strategies, providing recommendations based upon the learnings in our pilot projects, our research, and best practices from other regions. Next. You may have also heard about our climate resilience roundtables, where we brought together hundreds of community members from diverse backgrounds to discuss climate adaptation strategies for challenges such as wildfires and smoke, heat and floods. Some of the solutions are particularly targeted toward the most vulnerable populations. And CEC is part of a team planning three climate resilience centers and working on other strategies that are identified in the report that is listed here. CEC's 2022 action plan, achieving climate resilience on the central coast. Another priority is ensuring historically excluded members 
of the community have access to local planning processes. And in fact, CEC has two bilingual community ambassadors that were first hired on to help uh, SB CAG with a more inclusive process for the regional transportation plan. And these two ambassadors are now working full time on many initiatives to expand inclusivity and address climate justice needs in our communities. And so that's our presentation today. Now we can uh, move into the Q&A. If you have questions um, that you haven't asked yet, go ahead and add them. We have a, a robust list of them. Um, and remember, if you have a question, someone else probably has the same one, so there's no bad questions. Okay, let me look at some of these questions here. Um, and Jamal, I think I'll be asking you the first one. This one's from Larry. Uh, or maybe you're already, well, are there rebates for upgrading rental housing from 100 amp electric panels to 200 amp panels? Jamal, do you want to answer that one live? Yeah, can you see me? Yes, and hear you. Um, yeah, this was, uh, so are, are the rebates for uh, updating electrical panels um, from 100 to 200 amps? And the answer is yes, there are rebates for that. Um, <clears throat> I'll take the specific numbers out of, of, of the answer because there's no specification on the, the capacity of service that's required for upgrading, uh, but there are resources uh, both in the electrification rebates, um, the whole home efficiency rebates, as well as both the 25C tax credit, that's for heat pumps installation, um, and also electrical panel upgrades, um, and the 25D tax credits for things like solar, geothermal. All of those include um, incentives for upgrading electrical service. Thank you for that. I, I wanna add also that uh, uh, Central Coast Community Energy has a great program to help to upgrade panels. If, if you live um, in Santa Barbara County, except for the cities of Santa Barbara and Lompoc, or any of the cities in um, San Luis Obispo County, as well as further on North all the way up to Santa Cruz. So definitely check out um, that program that they have. Let's see, we have a question for Alexis. Um, this is from Kimberly and she says, is the CEC model including data and knowledge base utilized by other counties in California? And if so, which ones? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, right now I think this policy team is being stood up this year. And so we are really just trying to get as many collective voices possible that are willing to get involved and wanting to, to dive into the policy action and policy advocacy work um, that's available in their region. Um, so right now we're taking um, just collective voices of, of folks living in our region. Um, I hope that answers your question a little bit. Yeah, and I'll follow up that there's a network of different organizations like CEC that work all throughout the state. And so we work with many of them through like um, the Climate Center or um, CalCAN in, in the agriculture to really um, raise up the, the local policies that are working at the local level um, to get more state attention or state bills that are passed. All right, let's see if we have another um, question for Jamal. It looks like he's answered most of them <laughs> in the Q&A box. You can see them um, in the answered section of the Q&A box. So folks can go there. It looks like there's 10 questions or so that have been answered there. Let's see, some questions for me. Um, or actually, here's one for Jamal. Uh, our assembly member, this is from Joe Conant. Our assembly member, Steve Bennett, is a strong advocate of carbon taxes, but says there's not enough support, even if it's revenue neutral. So yeah, Jamal, anything on, you know, on the federal level with uh, carbon taxes or any thoughts on um, carbon taxes versus uh, like the bill that was passed um, that's more the, the carrots in, in the IRA? Yeah, um, I, I didn't know if that was for me. But yeah, the, the 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 Inflation Reduction Act did include like a carbon trading program. And I'll be honest, I'm not as up to speed on that particular uh, program. But it is, it, the, the IRA did create something like that. What I would say broadly about carbon taxes is that... Um, which, which I think are, which is, which is different than the carbon trading program. The carbon trading program is um, a little bit like cap and trade, but 
where where there, there's opportunity for companies to um to get credits and trade credits for the amount that they emit um carbon taxes in itself are not very popular and for a long time um we've gotten strong opposition and i think that sort of backdrop is is why the inflation reduction act is is so important and like the the approach that the inflation reduction act takes is so important because it takes uh more of a carrot approach like michael like what you had said at the very top <clears throat> Uh, most of what's in the Inflation Reduction Act are incentives. So they're not penalizing people for, uh, you know, making decisions or for um, for outcomes that they're uh, uh, advancing, but they're instead promoting different decisions through, in, through tax credits, through financing, um, and also through uh, consumer uh, grant and loan programs. Um, so that was a, a a shift in the way that we've thought about climate action, uh, you know, for a long time, and I think was a, a big factor into why it ultimately passed. Thanks for that answer, and we're uh, going to wrap up the Q and A to get to our closeout. But I I would like to ask one more question for you, Jamal, and this this is one that you answered in the chat, but I think it might be worth elucidating for for folks. And it was from Larry Bishop. He said, can landlords get rentals or get rebates for rental upgrades? And um, maybe for some of the renters who might want to advocate, you know, to talk with their landlords. Um, can you talk about how um, that might work? Yeah, I, I definitely would uh, encourage renters to advocate with their uh, with their landlords, recognizing that there often is a, a um, there are there sometimes can not be the best relationship between renters and landlords. So I, I get that, but um, withstanding, I do encourage renters to, to advocate. Um, so for multifamily buildings, when it comes to the electrification rebates, landlords are able to, um, to get and benefit from those point of sale rebates. If the uh, greater than 50% of the tenants are low and moderate income. Um, and that definition includes the 150% area median income definition, which is is um, I think more generous than other other income eligible programs. So, uh, but we'll have to wait and see what that actually looks like in terms of numbers. Um, the whole home efficiency grants or rebates are not point of sale. I should say that. So, any upgrade that you have and make you would have to verify your savings and then take that sort of piece of paper or whatever it is to the state energy office uh, to claim your rebate, sort of a mail, a mail in or after the fact rebate situation. That program is both for consumers directly, but also for aggregators. And aggregators is sort of a loose term that can mean, uh, and I put this, I answered this in uh, the Q&A as well, like it could mean a utility, it could mean you know, a, a community choice aggregator uh, could also mean a, pro a developer or property owner that owns multiple buildings. Um, any of those entities can be an aggregator and can improve the quality of of, of their um, inefficiency of their buildings and sort of aggregate the savings in order to get a rebate on the back end. Um, I know it's a long winded answer, but I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. And I'm sure we're going to see a lot more details and analysis to come as, as these programs actually get launched next year. Um, and then I want to just also direct any renters um, to 3C RENS programs because they do have a multifamily program as well. Um, and so by going to 3C RENS website, you, you can check out um, some of the other ways to uh, make improvements in your building. Okay, well, if we can launch the presentation for the last uh, few wrap up slides. Um, thank you. Uh, I'd like to really share a round of appreciations um, for today's speakers, Jamal and Alexis, and you can also um, share any appreciations in the chat. Thank you also to our sponsors, uh, Marburg, to the Santa Barbara County Sustainability Department, and Santa Barbara Clean Energy. Three events like this are just one of the ways that the Community Environmental Council works to advance rapid and equitable solutions to the climate crisis. 
And events like this are only made possible because of donations from individuals like you. As you consider your end of year investments, no matter the amount, we hope you will consider a gift to our work. You can visit the QR code on the screen or visit cecsb.org forward slash donate. Look for a follow-up email in the next few days with a recording of this webinar, presentations, and other resources that were shared today. And Nicole, do we have one last poll that we wanted to share? I won't read through the poll questions, but um, you can review them and, and please um, help us so that we can make our webinars better in the future. When you're done answering the poll, um, if we can move to the next slide to share CEC's impact report. As you can see, with the support of many partners, we've made a ton of progress towards a clean energy transition. And our impact report is also available on our website if you want to read the, the full report. Some of CEC's accolades over 50 years of proven results. So thank you so much again for tuning into our CEC webinar series as we focus on taking bold action, putting a stop to climate change, and reimagining how we live on our planet. We hope that today's webinar will inspire you to join us.